So, y'all, who remembers the lessons from last time, y'all? Anybody remember? Hey, well, that's why we're going to review them today. Okay? So we're going to review all four. So your objective for today is I'm going to review the three lessons we took last when we were taking lessons. And they're like, what is a computer? How do computers represent data? And then what is a transistor, right? Those are the three things I need y'all to know before we move on. Anybody have any questions about the objective? No? Okay. Right, what is a computer? Who remembers what a computer is? Hello? Uh -huh. Who remembers what a computer is? I don't. You don't remember what so, it is? So, there's three steps to do a computer. So you remember what they are? Yeah. Input, if input, uh -huh. um, and read data, and then output data. Uh -huh. Oh, you're close. You remember what a computer is? You don't remember what a computer is? You remember what a computer is, Mia? No. No? Alright, so, okay, so a computer has, alright, it's something that does, it's something that does math, and it's from the Latin computer, right, and it's input, it does four things, it inputs data, so it like takes it in, it stores it, it processes it, and then it outputs it, and it's, it's basically just a word that means someone or something that does math, right? Y'all remember this stuff? Good. Here's a review video. That's it. Hope y'all review it, right? My name is Amy Koo, and I'm a designer and an inventor. So some of the things I've designed have been Apple, now I design products for kids to use so that they can have an easier time in school. Okay, what? Hold on. Yeah. Uh, the video. Cool. My name is Mamie Koo, and I'm a designer and an inventor. So some of the things I've designed have been at Apple, and now I design products for kids to use so that they can have an easier time in school. My other jobs include DJing and dancing. Computers are everywhere. There are people's pockets. There are people's cars. People have them on their wrists. They might be in your backpack right now. But what makes a computer a computer? What does make a computer a computer anyway? And how does it even work? I am that. I was one of the original designers of the Xbox. Uh, I've been working with computers since I was maybe seven years old, uh, and now I work on virtual reality. As humans, we've always built tools to help us solve problems. Tools like a wheelbarrow, a hammer, or a printing press, or a tractor trailer. All of these inventions helped us with manual work. Over time, people began to wonder if a machine could be designed and built to help us with the thinking work we do, like solving equations or tracking the stars in the sky. Rather than moving or manipulating physical things like dirt and stone, these machines would need to be designed to manipulate information. As the pioneers of computer science explored how to design a thinking machine, they realized that it had to perform four different tasks. It would need to take input, store information, process it, and then output the results. Now this might sound simple, but these four things are common to all computers. And that's what makes a computer a computer. The earliest computers were made out of wood and metal with mechanical levers and gears. By the 20th those, century, though, those were computers started using electrical components. These early computers were really large and really slow. Yeah. A computer the size of a room might take hours just to do a basic math problem. These machines are things of gleaming, very colored metal and numerous flashing lights. 
computers started out as basic calculators, which was already really awesome at the time, and they were only manipulating numbers yeah. back then. But now we can use them to talk to each other, we can use them to play games, control robots, and do any crazy thing that you could probably imagine. Modern computers look nothing like those clunky old machines, but they still do these same four things. First, we're going to talk about input. This is my favorite, because what input is, is the stuff that the world does, or that you do, that makes the computer do stuff. You can tell a computer what to do with the keyboard, you can tell them what to do with the mouse, the microphone, the camera, and now if you're wearing a computer on your wrist, it might listen to your heartbeat, or in your car, it might be listening to what the car is doing, and a touch screen can actually sense your finger, and it takes that as input on what it's doing. Pay attention to what input is. So I'm going to ask questions. All these different inputs give a computer information, which is then stored in memory. A computer's processor takes information from memory, it manipulates it or changes it using an algorithm, which is just a series of commands, and then it sends the process information back to be stored in memory again. This continues until the processed information is ready to be output. How a computer outputs information depends on what the computer is designed to do. A computer display can show text, photos, videos, or interactive games, even virtual reality. The output of a computer may even include signals to control a robot. And when computers connect over the internet, the output from one computer becomes the input to another, and vice versa. The computers we use today look really different from the earliest thinking machines. And who knows what the computers of tomorrow will be like. My hope is that you get to help decide what you want the computers of tomorrow to look like. But across all computers, regardless of the different types of technology they use, they're all of them doing the same four things. They take in information, they store it as data, they process it, and then they output the results. So what are the four things a computer does? All right, so then the second lesson we took was how computers represent data, right? Who knows how, who remembers how computers represent data? Tsunami? Who knows what is data? Uh, data is like Not quite. Data is like what, what gets inputted and outputted. Data? Yeah, that's what gets inputted and outputted into the computer. It's called data, right? So that was from the second lesson we took, right? Yeah. So um, how do computers represent data? Okay, so anybody, where did that go? Okay, so how do computers represent data? So all, everything that a computer inputs and outputs, that's, that we call that data, right? So who remembers how they represent data? Um, they put them in the computer and then it comes out to a different computer, which is like having a map. Yeah, but how do they represent data? It's on the screen. Yeah, so all data it boils down to zeros and ones, right? Mm -hmm. So everything a computer takes in, it can take in keyboard information, pictures, text, everything it takes in and everything it puts out all comes down to zeros and ones, right? Binary, right? Um, and then they turn these zeros and ones, we call it, what is one, what is one bit? Who remembers what a bit is? What's a it's bit? Like a little pixel and like a photo. And yeah, it can be, a bit can be two options, right? True, false, zero, one. Um, and basically, one bit is like one, well, like one wire. And so computers represent things with bits, right? Y'all follow? Just a video from the second.
computers to work on ones and zeros. Or you may have seen scary looking visuals like this, but almost nothing today actually deals directly with these ones and zeros. But ones and zeros do play a big role in how computers work on yeah, the inside. These are very important people. Inside a computer are electric wires and circuits that carry all the information in a computer. How do you store or represent information using electricity? Well, if you have a single wire with electricity flowing through it, the signal can either be on or off. That's not a lot of choices, but it's a really important start. With one wire, we can represent a yes or a no, true or false, a one or a zero, or anything else with only two options. This on-off state in a single wire is called a bit, and it's the smallest piece of information the computer can store. If you use more wires, you get more bits. More ones and zeros with more bits, you can represent more complex information. But to understand that, we need to learn about something called the binary number system. In the decimal number system, we have 10 digits from 0 to 9, and that's how we've all learned to count. In the binary number system, we only have two digits, yep. 0 okay. and 1. True and false. With these two digits, we can count up to any number. Here's how this works. In the decimal number system we're all used to, each position in a number has a different value. There's the 1 position, the 10 position, the 100 position, and this the 1. This is place value. You all take For the place example, value, right? A 9 in the 100 Good. position is a 900. In binary, each position also carries a value, but instead of multiplying by 10 each time, we multiply by 2. So there's the 1's position, the 2's position, the 4's position, the 8th position, and so on. For example, the number 9 in binary is 1, 0, 0, 1. To calculate the value, we add 1 times 8, plus 0 times 4, plus 0 times yeah, 2, plus well, 1 times when you're one. doing place value? Almost nobody does this math because computers do it for us. What's important is that any number can be represented with only 1s and zeros, or by a bunch of wires that are on or off. The more wires you use, the larger the numbers you can store. With 8 wires, you can store numbers between 0 and 255. Eight ones. With just 32 wires, you can store all the way from zero to over 4 billion. Using the binary number system, you can represent any number you like. But what about other types of information, like text, images, or sound? It turns out that all these things can also be represented with numbers. Okay. Everything Think of all the letters in the alphabet. We could assign a number to each letter. A could be 1, B could be 2, This is called so ASCII. You can this is represented using a system like this. <coughs> now, let's consider photos, videos, and all the graphics Mind you see on the screen. All of these images are made out of teeny dots called pixels. And each pixel has a color. Each of the colors can be represented with numbers. When you consider that a typical image has millions of these pixels, and a typical video shows 30 images per second, and we're talking about a lot of data here. Sound. Every sound is basically a series of vibrations in the air. Vibrations can be represented graphically as a waveform. Yep. Any point on this waveform can be represented by a number. And this way, any sound can be broken down into a series of numbers. If you want higher quality sound, you will pick 32-bit audio over 8-bit audio. More bits means a higher range of numbers. When you use a computer to write code or make your own app, you're not dealing directly with these ones and zeros, but you will be dealing with images or sound or video. So if you want to understand how computers work on the inside, it all comes down to these simple ones and zeros and the electrical signals in the circuits behind them. They are the backbone of how all computers input, store, process, and output information.
from the other. So, everything from text to graphics to video gets broken down into numbers, right? So text, you assign a number for every letter, and then sound, it's like waveforms, you sample it. Um, and then graphics, you just, it, it's pixels, and there's three numbers per pixel. And then we store numbers until we convert them to binary and store them as zeros and ones, right? Y'all following? Cool. So what's a bit? A uh, bit is like the same as this bit. No, no, what's a bit? A bit is one something that has two options. Oh, no, a bit is something that's true or false. Or yeah, what's a, what, what, what? What? What's a bit? It's something that has two options of yes or no, true or false. Yeah. Two on or off. Yes yep. Or and then now we're going to look at the last one, right? So what is a transistor? Who remembers what a transistor is? That was from like the, the last lesson we took. No one remembers what a transistor is? Well, okay, a transistor is how computers represent bits, like, it's like the hardware of bits, right? So it's, a, it's like a switch, you know how a switch works? It's like on or off, and then we use transistors to like represent a uh, binary. So if there's electricity running through the wire, then it's on. But if the transistor tells us how much electricity needs to be counted as a bit, for the bit to be on, right? You don't, you understand what I'm saying? Like, and then, they then we can start to combine transistors to form gates, like logic gates, which we're going to talk about next class. And from this video, I need y'all to pick two things that you want to learn from next for next class, okay? That you found interesting from this video, because this video is going to go into stuff we're going to cover next class. Mm -hmm. So just tell me two things you you want to learn from this video. <laughs> Modern computers are revolutionizing our lives, performing tasks unimaginable only decades ago. This was made possible by a long series of innovations, but there's one foundational invention that almost everything else relies upon, the transistor. So what is that? And how does such a device enable all the amazing things computers can do? Well, at their core, all computers are just what the name implies. Machines that perform mathematical operations. Yep. The earliest computers were manual counting devices, like the Abacus, while later ones used mechanical parts. What made them computers was having a way to represent numbers and a system for manipulating them. Electronic computers work the same way, but instead of physical arrangements, the numbers are represented by electric voltages. Yep. Most such computers use a type of math called Boolean logic that has only two this possible is like the math of binary. the logical conditions true and false, denoted by binary digits 1 and 0. They are represented by high and low voltages. Equations are implemented via logic gate circuits that produce an output of 1 or 0 based on start the talking about these next class. satisfying logic a certain logical statement. These circuits perform three fundamental logical operations, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. The way conjunction works is an AND gate provides. We're going to talk about this next class. I just wanted to introduce y'all to two high voltage you know? inputs, and the other gates work by similar principles. Circuits can be combined to perform complex operations like addition and subtraction, and computer programs consist of instructions for electronically performing these operations. This kind of system needs a reliable and accurate method for controlling electric current. Early electronic computers, like the ENIAC, used a device called the vacuum tube. Its early form, the diode, consisted of two electrodes in an evacuated glass container. Applying a voltage to the cathode makes it heat up and release electrons. If the anode is at a slightly higher positive potential, the electrons are attracted to it, completing the circuit. This unidirectional current flow could be controlled by varying the voltage to the cathode which makes it release more or less electrons. The next stage was the triode, which uses a third electrode called the grid. This is, some this is a wire screen between the cathode and anode, through we'll which electrons could pass. Um, Varying its voltage makes it no, repel or attract so. the electrons emitted by the cathode, thus enabling fast current switching. The ability to amplify signals also made the triode crucial for radio and long-distance communication. 
But despite these advancements, vacuum tubes were unreliable and bulky. With 18,000 triads, ENIAC was nearly the size of a yeah, remember these were the computers that were the size of buildings that couldn't do math. Tubes failed every other day, and in one hour, it consumed the amount of electricity used by 15 homes in a day. The solution was the transistor. Instead of electrodes, it uses a semiconductor like silicon, yep. treated with different elements to create an electron emitting n type and an electron of All you need to know is that it takes, it These turns on if there's enough electricity and turns off if there's not enough. At each, the emitter, the base, and the collector. In this typical NPN transistor, due to certain phenomena at the PN interface, a special region called a PN junction forms between the emitter and base. It only conducts electricity when a voltage exceeding a certain threshold is applied. Otherwise, it, it remains switched through. off. In this way, small variations in the input voltage can be used to quickly switch between high and low output currents. The advantage of the transistor lies in its efficiency and compactness. Because they don't require heating, they're more durable and use less power. ENIAC's functionality can now be surpassed by a single fingernail-sized microchip containing billions of transistors. At trillions of calculations per second, today's computers may seem like they're performing miracles. But underneath it all, each individual operation is still as simple as the flick of a switch. So that was kind of like an in a segue into the next lesson. Next lesson, we're going to talk about logic gates. The things you saw at the beginning, with the like when you stack them up. Anyway, so the conclusion, so you should have learned three things. What is a computer? Who remembers what a computer is? Um, what does it do? It has to input data, uh -huh. store, process it, and run it. Okay, what is a computer used to represent data? Yep. Binary. Yep, binary and bits. And then how do we represent bits physically? What are, what are the, the wires called? And what's at the end of the wires? The third thing. What's at the end of the wires? It's those like where it's the binary thing where it's like the it has like let's say you have nine hundred. It'll show you nine. No, what's at the very end of the wires? Like in the in the computer dude. What's the transistor? That was the last video. The la last part we talked about? It. We talked about it in the last lesson. So a transistor is like the switch, right? It turns on if there's enough electricity, and it gives us a 1. And then if there's not enough electricity, it gives us a 0. Y'all understand? Mm -hmm. Alright, y'all ready for the fun part now? We're going to play Kahoot. 